about? What's it really about? What genre does it take? What, what, like, it, it's like, a, like the spine? The spine, yeah. Like one sentence? Like no, one I don't fucking boy meets girl. I don't give a shit about that. Fuck boy meets girl. Fuck motorcycle movie. No, what is really being said? What's really being seen? That's what you're talking about. Because the whole idea, man, is subversion. You want subversion on a massive level. You know what one of the greatest fucking scripts ever written in the history of Hollywood is? What? Top Gun. Oh, come on. Top, Top Gun, Gun is fucking great. What is Top Gun? You think it's a story about a bunch of fighter pilots? Yeah, it's about a bunch of guys waving their dicks around. It is a story about a man's struggle with his own homosexuality. <laughs> That's it. That is what Top Gun is about, man. You've got Maverick, all right? He's on the edge, man. He's right on the fucking line, all right? And you've got Iceman and all his crew. Right. They're gay. And they, are, they represent the gay man, right. all right? And they're saying, go. Go the gay way. Go the gay way. He could go both ways. What about Kelly McGillis, right? Kelly McGillis, she's, she's, she's heterosexuality. She's saying, no, 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 no. Go the normal way. Play by the rules. Go the normal way. And they're saying, no, go the gay way. Be the gay way. Go for the gay way. All right, that is what's going on throughout that whole movie. He goes to her house, right? All right, it looks like they're going to have sex. You know, they're just kind of sitting back. He's taking a shower and everything. They don't have sex. He gets on the motorcycle, drives away. She's like, what the fuck? What the fuck is going on here? Right. Next scene. Next scene you see her, she's in the elevator, she is dressed like a guy. She's got the, the cap on, she's got the uh, aviator class, she's, she's wearing the same jacket that the Iceman wears. She goes, okay, this is how I gotta get this guy. This guy's going towards the gateway. So I gotta bring him back, I gotta bring him back from the gateway. So I'm gonna do that through subterfuge, I'm gonna dress like a man, <laughs> all right? That is how she, she, she approaches it. But the real ending of the movie is when they fight the minutes at the end, all right? Because he has passed over into the gateway. They are this gay fighting fucking force, all right? And they're beating the Russians, the gays are beating the Russians, all right? And it's over, and they fucking land, and Iceman's been trying to get Maverick the entire time. Finally, he's got him, all right? And what is the last fucking line that they have together? They're all hugging and kissing and happy with each other, and Ice comes up to Maverick, and he says, man, and you can ride my tail in this time. And what does Maverick say? Maverick, you can ride my sword fight! Sword fight! Sword fight! Fucking idiot! You You yeah. were talking about when you when you kind of when you kind of focus on an idea and you get the mania for it. How do you sustain the mania when the filmmaking process takes so long? And especially, it seems like your idea. How do you shut out all the million other ideas that are flooding your head when you know you have to focus and make one thing? Oh, that's a good question, but that's actually not that difficult. Insofar as um, before I settle in on what I'm going to do, I'm I'm contemplating a lot of different things. Oh, there's that book that I've always wanted to turn into a movie. Maybe I'd start reading that again and go over my old notes. Uh, uh, I, I explore some different ideas, uh, you know, see what stage in the incubator <laughs> that they are at, at any given time, especially when I'm looking for inspiration. Uh, I'm always like working on some film book project to some degree or another that it moves along by a, you know a couple of inches yeah. <laughs> between each movie. I'm never in any hurry to do it. Play tectonics. Just... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just say, well, well, oddly enough, it actually um, that usually breeds what I'm going to do next to some degree or another because I'm working on I work on different film book projects and stuff, and um, I love that type of writing and I like the research that goes into that type of writing and um, and it brings me a lot of joy. But it's not as easy for me as screenplay story writing is. And um, so it's much more difficult. Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm working harder at it, and I'm working harder at it. And at some point, I've invested a lot in it, and it's hard, and then I, you know, uh, what am I doing? This is so <laughs> difficult. Nobody is waiting for this. This is just for me, and I'm working so hard. And then I start trying to write a script or a story, and by comparison... It's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy that uh, I'm kind of off and running, you know, from that point on. Um, but in the case of what you're asking about is I, you know, I, I flirt and, you know, it's almost a, a metaphor for falling in love. You date a lot of people and you flirt with a lot of people and everything's going great. Um, but then you meet the right one. And once, you, once, once I realize that, oh, okay, uh, this has grabbed me. And oh, this this is genuinely legit. And now I'm, maybe I'm thinking about music choices for it, and trying to find different music choices for it, and web spinning about it, and maybe it gets me to actually start writing a little bit. And pretty shortly into that process, I'll probably end up writing something that's like, okay, I'm doing this now. This is this is now what I'm doing. 
uh, usually because I think it's so – whatever I've written is so good that I'd yeah. like, okay, the, this deserves to be explored. Um, in the case of Django, the way that happened happened very organically. Uh, I had really no idea what I was going to do after Inglorious Bastards. And, uh, but I'd had the idea for Django and Chain in my head for a long, long time. The idea of like a spaghetti western hiss black bounty hunter going and still killing uh, – arresting or killing people during slave time. And um, so I was, uh, uh, I was in um, Japan doing my press on, uh, on uh, Inglorious Bastards. And Japan was like the last stop on the trip. So I'd kind of just – I'd done everything. This was my last official thing to do. And so I was there with a friend of mine and we were in Japan. I had a day off and I got pointed in the direction of a really cool soundtrack store. And in Japan, there, uh, uh, there, there's a, a really big niche following for spaghetti westerns. They call them macaroni westerns and they're still real popular. <laughs> and a lot, of the, a lot of the spaghetti westerns you can't find in America you can get in Japan and almost all the soundtracks are available to one degree or another. So I loaded up on a bunch of CD soundtracks. And so then on my day off, I, you, know, you know how you do when you buy a bunch of records at a record store. You come home and you just start playing them and you're walking around and you're just zoning out and blissing out. And, uh, and so being bombarded with all these Morricone, Riz on Ortolani, uh, sound, uh, for, uh, Francesco Damasi soundtracks, um, I ended up sitting down. And I didn't even have – normally I have my notebooks with me and shit, but I didn't have anything. So I literally was using the hotel stationery at the you know, Tokyo Nico or whatever it was and uh, wrote the opening scene of Django and Chain where you know, they're on, the, sla- they're on the, the chain gang. They're walking through and then the, 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 uh, the wagon – yeah. Shows up and it's Schultz and he's looking. And he has the conversation with the brutal brother or the, uh, the Speck brothers, and the, the, pretty much the way it is in the movie was how it was written on the little desk wow. in the hotel room on the hotel stationery, and uh, and you know and it was a good scene and it set it at all it set it off and I I wanted to know more and so I knew halfway into that scene oh I guess this is. Django and Cheney's been in my head for a long time. I guess now is the time. Wow. But that's an interesting way to put it. You said you wanted to know more, almost as yeah. though, like, as you're writing, you're sort of, the writing is, you're, you're discovering along as it's coming out. Well, I think that's really is the, the way you really need to do it. Now, once I got done with that scene, I mean, uh, it's, it's one of the benefits of, um, of starting with a classical on its own scene, like the opening scene of, of Inglorious Bastards or the opening scene of Django that can literally be a scene unto itself. Now where do I want to go from right. here becomes the question. But in that moment, at that situation, oh, no, that's just good enough. Right. That is, that is on its own. And what I've learned as time has gone on is um, for a long time I tried to think out everything in the story even though I know things would completely change as I, as I go on. However, now I've realized that it's not really – it doesn't do me much good – to think too much past the middle. I mean, I might know where I want to go. I mean, it, you know, I write genre pieces, so you have an idea what the third act's going to be, uh, you know, and kill Bill. I guess she'll probably kill Bill at the end. <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, she's got a list. She's going to work down the list, all right? So the big choice is, well, who's who on the list, all right? Um, and even, I fuck, even that I fucked around with, all right? Um, but... Um, uh, but, you know, a genre movie, you think you know where you're going and you're probably right and you have an idea of how you might want the ending to end as for, you know, for both a movie and for an audience. But for the most part, you can kind of work out more or less what's going to get you to the middle. But to think beyond that is kind of silly because um, by the time you get to the middle when you've actually been writing it, well – it's a different story now. It's mm. a different thing now. Now, now you are the characters. You know the characters. Things that you could never have known before you started yeah. writing are now they're in your blood. It's like this entire you know there is a mythology to my movies to some degree or another. And that mythology is delivered as as I write, and I might have a, a, a checklist of things that I might want to do during the course of the time, but some of them you know, are you know uh, become irrelevant. Yeah. As you go on and when other ones take their place and some things that you 
thought could have been a big deal? Well, they are a big deal. And some things you – about maybe half the reason you wanted to write it. By the time you get to where that would happen, eh, it's, it's for something else. It's not for this. Um, but by the time you get to the middle, that's where you want to be. You want to have the, be this expert. You want to be in the middle of the story. You want to know who these people are. And now with all this knowledge, now you figure out – where you want to go for the second half. But that's an interesting that's an interesting approach to writing being like you have to be a good listener and you have to listen to your own characters once they're fully once they're mostly formed. Well, frankly, I only think it's screenwriters who think you're not supposed to do it yeah, that do you way. Out, do, you, right? <laughs> do you outline? No, not really. See, I, I don't mean, either. I just write. Yeah, you just write. I mean, you know, it's like I mean uh I mean some novelists, the more commercial novelists, you know, uh 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 write uh, I think like John Grisham or somebody they write outlines because they don't want to get to that final chapter and go oh my god what the fuck do I do yeah. now <laughs> all right um I trust in oh my god what the fuck am I going to do now mm-hmm. right I mean I I think that is part of it you know now I'll go I don't write a novel a year the way he does and there, there's a reason for that uh but I am trusting that I will know exactly what to do right. when I get there from having done the work one way or the other, you know, and uh, but it's that trust you have to trust. You have to trust, you know, that it's going to be there. Yeah. When you reach out. Like uh, even to kind of give you an example, like in the case of something like like Kill Bill, where it's like the first time I'm really kind of creating for I don't know, lack of a better word, like a comic book mythology going like on the marvel universe i'm there. totally creating my version of that and um and i remember i was watching i was watching a movie once that i thought was uh, the director did, did a talented job with it having said that he is he was trying to kind of create his own world but i realized he didn't know it that well he hadn't thought about everything he hadn't painted in every picture of that universe so i knew i wasn't in good hands he dealt with what he needed to deal with, but I know that there was a lot of questions he didn't ask. And I, and I knew that when you create a mythology, stuff, forget about it, stuff that, uh, that never will make it to the movie, you need to know everything. You need to, you know, like I need to know how Bill was born, how Bill got to be Bill. You're talking about actor subtext. Yeah, but in the case of me, like I said, if you're creating a mythology, you got to know all the rules of that. It has, doesn't matter what the audience knows. They got to know you know. And now you can explain to the actors this is, you know, I don't know, something as simple as, you know, one of the rules of a Hanzo sword is once you unsheath it, it has to drink blood before it ever goes back in the sheath. You know, even if it just means you, you know, got to like put your thumb to it. You know, it's got, it's thirsty. Now, Daryl Hannah doesn't do that when she's like, oh, hey, this is a pretty good sword <laughs> with Michael Madsen and he's, you know, dumb bitch she's not going to say anything to her you know so again she kind of goes into the fight with you know with the demerit against her it was like that bad karma uh, with that speak. bad karma now the audience doesn't need to know that but it was important that the actors know that and it's important that i know that that there's you know there's more there there so um i make it a i make it a point even when it comes to slang i go look is there anything you don't know what you're saying I want you to know what you're saying, all right? Uh, just, uh, you know, some, uh, whatever, it could be any kind of expression. Uh, well, according to Hoyle, this class should be blah, blah, blah. Well, if you don't know what I'm referring to when I say according to Hoyle, then you're just spouting a line. Well, what, what does that mean, according to Hoyle? Well, you know, there's a book of rules of card games, and it's called according to, and it's a book of Hoyle, and that's an expression. You know, so I have to explain, you know, I want them to know what it is. But I'll go, so I have them making references all the time. Oh. You get great performances from these actors. Yeah. Why, why is that? You think? Because hmm. uh, well, it really stands out yeah. in a lot of your movies, oh, obviously. Okay. Well, you know, it all it kind of. I think it's a it's a three prong thing. You know, um, I write good characters. I write interesting mm-hmm. characters. Uh, I then I cast them well. I cast them well, and uh, but part of casting well is usually unless I'm writing it for somebody in particular, and sometimes that works out, and sometimes that doesn't. Um, uh, it's about the character first. It's not the actor mm-hmm. first. I, my, I don't have an obligation to give a groovy actor a role. I have an obligation to find the best person to play my character. 
they're my characters. They came from deep in my DNA, and I want them to have the perfect person to play them. I'm not writing theater where you know everybody for right. the next 20 years gets a crack at it. <laughs> this is this is it. Uh, but <laughs> right. I think what you're saying there is other other directors break down and they go and they go with the groovy guy. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's, it's kind of easy to do. It's almost the whole industry seems to be heading that way. And, Usually the groovy guy is groovy for a reason, so (laughs) all well and good. But if you really want it to be magical, like, say, you know, Christoph Waltz as Londa, Mm -hmm. then it's got to be a focus where I'm looking for the right guy and Mm -hmm. only the right guy guy will do. And then you just add to the fact that, you know, I I know how to deal with actors. I, for lack of a better word, I speak actor talk. So I know how to get the best out of them and take care of them. So on Switchblade Sisters, you have this piece where you talk about his cadence and how through his cadence he creates humor and Mm -hmm. compared it to your dialogue in Pulp Fiction. So when I met Jack Hill, I said, who do you you look to for for dialogue? And he Uh he names the playwright uh, Strindberg, August Strindberg. uh So I wanted to ask you, kind of, do you ever look back to the classical writers and who are the biggest influences on you in terms of uh, dialogue, either writing or or hearing it? I actually think when it comes to my dialogue, I mean, I think the... um... The three writers that affected it the most as far as like a, a genuine influence would probably be a combination of uh, um, uh, Elmore Leonard, David Mamet, and Richard Pryor. And I think that – I think those were actual conscience, conscious influences in me – finding my voice and my my dialogue and character voices and stuff. However, while this other person wasn't an influence, and even to this day I don't really consider him an influence, when I watch some of this material, I do recognize uh, a a similar aspect to their dialogue is somebody like Petty Chayefsky. When I watched Petty Chayefsky, I was actually surprised that, oh, wow, that's, you know, as I started to discover, once I started writing, uh, uh, other friends of mine kind of pointed out that uh, th- there was a symmetry to our dialogue to some degree or another. But the funny thing about Petty Chayefsky was um, it was almost via Petty Chayefsky that I actually realized that I actually uh, was not a, was a pretty good writer and maybe want to think about exploring this a little bit. Because how I actually kind of discovered writing dialogue is I used to be, uh, I'd be an actor and I'd be in acting classes. And... Um, and so part of your thing in acting class is to drum up scenes to do. And I always wanted to do scenes from movies and stuff. And then I didn't have access to any scripts or anything like that. So I would, like, go and watch a movie. And then I could remember. I have a good memory. So I'd remember the scene. So I'd go home and write the scene down. And whatever I didn't remember, I would just fill in the blanks myself. Well, little by little, I would just start filling in more blanks and more blanks and just kind of go off and do my own things and add to the scenes. That was me first, my first attempt at writing dialogue with stuff like that. And I had forgotten I was doing a scene with, from Marty, uh, Petty Chayefsky's Marty, in class. And I was, later I was talking to uh, the guy I did the scene with. And he goes, uh, I, I mentioned what I just mentioned. He goes, Cat Quinn, you're you're as good as Petty Chayefsky. I go, what are you talking about? Well, remember when we did Marty, and, and all of a sudden there's this monologue about the fountain. Y- yeah, that's not in Marty. That's you. <laughs> I actually, you gave me your handwritten version. I actually have Marty at home, and I go, there's there's there's, there's no fountain. There's no monologue about a fountain in this scene, but it fit in perfect with the scene. And I was like, well, it's just as good as the Patty Chayefsky stuff. And it was literally, it was him. His name was Ron Coleman, Ronnie Coleman. And um, when he said that, it was like the first ding. Little t- it was a little tiny dinner bell, you know, little, you know, like the one around the side of a table. Ding, ding, ding. All right. It was the first little ring that was like, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this. Maybe I should explore this a little bit more. Crime films give you a chance to write like a really, you know, muscular, fun, quotable dialogue. Uh, one of the things, though, that, um, again, people don't talk about it right now, but one of the things that was came out a lot, like when Reservoir Dogs came out, for instance, and then it was carried over with Pulp Fiction, was the fact that 
you know, people would make reference to, say, David Mamet or something when it came to my dialogue, but one of the people, one of the only people out there, or films out there, that I could really kind of point a reference to, as far as, like, the dialogue-heavy and the male dialogue-heavy aspect of it, other than David Mamet, was Barry Levinson. And people would always refer to Reservoir Dogs when it came out as something like, you know, Tin Men with Guns, or Diner with Guns. Because that was actually one of the only other movies that they could actually make a reference to that had young males, or males, anyway, uh, talking and expressing and actually talking about pop culture the way my characters do too. No, I know that's well. That's the thing is because to me, most movies that you see now—I mean, that used to be the thing about America was the fact that Hollywood. Forget America, Hollywood. Right. Hollywood used to—that's what we did better than anybody else in the world. We told a right. really good right. story. Right. You know, Europe was where you had character-based films or mood-based films, but America, we told the story. We're the worst at it now, as far as I'm concerned. At right. telling a story. I'm telling a story. We don't tell a story. We tell a situation. Most of the movies that you see nowadays, and I'm not a Hollywood basher because enough good movies come out of the Hollywood system every year to justify its existence. You know, but they, without any apologies. However, a good majority of movies that come out, all right, you pretty much know everything you're going to see in the movie by the first 10 or 20 yeah. minutes. Now, that's not a story. A story is something that constantly unfolds. I'm not talking about like this quick left turn or a quick right turn or a big surprise. I'm talking about it unfolds. All right. Yeah, but you don't believe in a linear storytelling. No. Well, it's not. You know, it's not so much I don't believe in it. Uh, it's the situation. Too... Well, it's no. It's it's not the fact that I'm like on this big crusade against linear storytelling. All right. But it's the thing is, it's not the only game in town. Now, the original structure of the script for True Romance is very different from the movie. The way it worked, even though it has almost identically the same scenes. I mean, really, it's, except for the ending, it was the structure that Tony didn't use. Everything else, I mean, God, he did exactly what I wrote. I mean, it was, it's pretty good. And it's all the scenes are there. They're just in different order. The way it worked initially was it would start with uh, the Elvis, uh, I'd fuck Elvis speech. Then there was the credits. Then there was the Dretzel pussy-eating speech. And we don't know who, who's this guy, and he kills all those other guys, and we're like, what the fuck's going on? Right, we still don't know what's going on. I like that. Don't know what's going on, but it's all entertaining. Then, the next scene, after the Dretzel Pussy Eating scene, is Clarence in Alabama showing up at Clarence's father's house, Dennis Hopper. And, uh, and so, the whole, like story more or less about uh, uh, Dretzel, uh, you know, her being his pimp and all that blah, 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 and the cocaine and all that stuff, all right, was told, uh, you just kind of hear it through Clarence's, slightly Clarence's version, but you don't quite hear the whole thing. But we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on, all right, and we only have uh, um, Clarence's slight version. So when we were watching this scene, we don't really know who to believe or what's going on. Just the, the scene, do kids seem like like sweet kids? All right. So they split. Then you know uh, he, he calls Dick Ritchie. Was it going to be coming up? Then there's this there's the uh, uh, the infamous or famous or whatever um, Christopher Walken uh, Dennis Hopper scene. Now. How the structure really affects us in a big way, the biggest difference between the way the movie works and the way the structure works, is we don't know Clarence's story. We don't know exactly any of the whys of the wherefores about how he met Alabama, how uh, uh, he ended up taking the cocaine or anything. It's all just very sketchy. All right, all we have is the fact that we kind of like these two kids, even though we don't know anything about them. The biggest difference is, you know, Audiences, as long as they're in good hands, they like being curious. They don't like to be told everything, all right? Uh, if they think that they're in good hands, if they think the storyteller will eventually take care of them, they can wait if they think, you know, uh, it's not a mistake, if they think it's on purpose. And so Christopher Walken comes in, and he gives us our first real information about what happened. But his information is like, okay, here's what happened. You know, your dumb fuck son and his whore come in there blazing. They found out we were going to do a cocaine deal. They came in there, they shot everybody, killed everybody, completed a total fucking massacre, and they took the dope and ran. So that's the first time we've actually heard complete information about exactly what happened. And, and so, like, our, our th you know, we're like, uh, we're, you know, our thoughts should be like, they did that? They're that crazy? They're that homicidal? All right, that was supposed to be the idea behind that. Uh, then, 
from that sequence, then we have Clarence arriving in, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Los Angeles in Hollywood. All right, and he gets together with Dick Ritchie, and then him and Dick in Alabama go out to Pink's hot dog stand, and they're talking, and then Dick literally says something to the effect of, oh, so, how, uh, uh, so how did you uh, meet Alabama? All right, and then he tells the story. All right, and that's the second act, and that starts with Clarence in the movie theater watching uh, the Street Fighter triple feature in Alabama coming in. And then that goes on through the whole second act in the movie until uh, um, uh, leading up to uh, 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 Clarence killing a, a Dretzel. And after the killing a Dretzel and finding the cocaine, from that point on, we pick up, this, we pick up the movie. Uh, it, it comes back uh, in the film to when uh, uh, Clarence shows Dick Ritchie the uh, um, the cocaine and about how to sell it, and and, and Dick Ritchie's like uh, uh, flipping out. All right, and then that's the third act, and that and from that point on, the movie's like like it is. All right, now the way that three act structure was supposed to work was this: the first act, everybody in the movie. With the possible exception of uh, 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 Cliff Worley, uh, Dennis Hopper, knows so much more than we do. All the characters know what they're talking about. We don't know what they're talking about. All the characters know what they did, again, except for Cliff. We don't. All right? Everybody in the movie is way ahead of the audience. All right. The second act, the audience hears the whole story and catches up with the characters. The third act, and this is where it starts getting kind of cool. And it's the only thing I miss is now the audience. Well, you know what? I say I miss it, but actually this still works. All right. Uh, the audience now knows more than the characters. The audience is so much more hipper about what's going on and what's happening than any of the any one of the characters in the movie. All right. You know, the audience knows that uh, uh, Clarence, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Clarence isn't uh, uh, working for a cop or anything like that to try to sell this cocaine. The audience uh, uh, knows that uh, Bronson shows uh, Elliot Blitzer, all right, is uh, working with the cops. All right, the audience knows what's waiting for Clarence up in that uh, hotel room, but we don't. Uh, I mean, uh, the audience knows, but Clarence doesn't. You know, it's like everybody is ahead of every uh, of all the characters. So that was the way it was supposed to be. Act one, audience doesn't know shit. Characters know everything. Act two, audience catches up. Act three, audience knows far more than anybody in the movie. Analogy I always use, because all of my writing techniques, I never took any writing classes or seminars or anything like that, or read any pam pamphlets. My whole thing was um, everything I learned as an actor, studying acting for six years, I've basically applied to writing. Now, like, if an but what did you learn then? Well, it's just like well, I'll give you I'll give you an actor analogy that works completely for me as a writer. All right, if uh, um, if I'm playing on I don't know whatever uh, Sugar Babies or something, you know, <laughs> something really crazy. All right, Sugar Babies. Okay, on on, on, on on in a theater production. All right, and I'm driving on my way to the theater, and uh, uh, I hit a dog on the way to the theater that night. Okay, now that doesn't make you commit suicide after you know killing a dog, but it, it's going to affect you. Yeah. All right. Okay, and no, I'm affected by that. Now the thing is. When I go out on stage, I have to bring that experience on with me, or what am I doing up there? All right, that is obviously going on with me at that time, and that needs to be that needs to be on the stage. That wait, it needs to be on the stage because it is what's happening inside of you. Yeah, exactly, true. Right. That's it. It's because it's what's happening inside of me. Now, if I'm doing Sugar Babies or or Death of a Salesman, or you can't take it with you, that doesn't mean the play all of a sudden becomes about a dead dog. Yeah. All right. But it definitely doesn't, but it definitely, I'm not there unless I bring that on with me and make that work inside of the material. If I'm not, then you could just send a robot out there. That's just good acting. That's what you have to do. You can't deny anything. All right. Well, the same thing with me as a writer. If I was writing The Guns of the Navarone, all right, mm -hmm. and then right, in the, right at the beginning of writing it or in the middle of writing it, I, I, I break up with my girlfriend who I'm like madly in love with and in my heart is, 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 is shattered, all right, that's got to work into it. Now, the story is still about a bunch of commandos going to blow up a couple of cannons, all right? Mm -hmm. But that pain that I'm feeling has got to find its way into this story or else 
Yeah. What am I doing? And translating to writing, meaning that whatever you're experiencing as a writer, you got to put into those characters and you know how to do that. Yeah. It's a, well, I mean, that's the thing I think that makes, I mean, that's why when people say, well, you're just making movies about other movies. I go, well, that's bull. I mean, to me, all my movies yeah. are, I mean, I'm, you, I'm working in a genre, no doubt about it. All right. And I, and I respect the genre, no doubt about and it. And what's the genre in your own definition? Well, in, in the ones I'm doing, I'm doing crime films. Okay. All right. And all then right. like in the case of Reservoir Dogs, it's a subgenre crime film. It's a heist picture. Right. A bunch of guys get together and pull a robbery. Right. You've Right, a bunch right. of kind of movies like that before, um, and the thing is though, but uh, I respect the genre, and I'm jumping off from it. But to me, all the movies are very personal. All right, when I look at them, and I don't mean like I'm some crook. All right, but the thing about it though is like you know, this group of friends will look at it and be like, oh Quinn, I can't believe you talked about that. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know yeah, and, and right. this old girlfriend. Because they oh, identify geez, with Quinn, the experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's like it's you know, it's it, you should be semi embarrassed about certain people seeing your movie. I think when you're finished, if you're working on a personal level, or, or else the work is not authentic. Well, I mean, I don't want to yeah. make that blanket a statement, but but I guess for me, I guess yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not doing. You're not. You're not extending yourself unless you're bringing all of that. You've in. got to. I mean, you've you, basically. I mean. Why do you a work? Writer, a writer, you know, you should have this little voice inside of you saying, tell the truth. Yeah. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Yeah. All right. Reveal a few secrets. And the in truth here. is your life experience. Exactly. That's, that's the truth as I know it. Right. <laughs> well, you know, it's just writing. I mean, uh, I mean, I consider novelist real writers. Now, I actually consider screenwriters real writers, too. And then and uh, there's a whole aspect about the fact that screenwriting conceivably could be harder because of mm -hmm. how you have to deliver within yes. a certain page count in a way that a novelist doesn't have to to some degree or another. It has more freedom as far as that's concerned. But I was listening to a, a podcast out of Australia where they were kind of going through a bunch of my screenplays and they'd actually read the screenplay. So they were actually quoting things from the scripts that didn't make the movie. And then they were, they were talking about how I would do these things in the scripts that will never play out in the movie. I'll give, I'll give you one example of it, actually. Okay, in, the, in Kill Bill, uh, there was a whole sequence that was taken out of the film where um, after the bride gets out of her coma and she's in the pussy wagon, mm -hmm. she, you know, it was in Texas somewhere, so she drives way out into the panhandle and she comes across this uh, uh, oil derrick. Mm -hmm. And the idea is she has stashed all this shit in the ground. So, uh, like, she's going to dig up a hole and pull out a footlocker, and it's going to have uh, uh, passports under a zillion different names. Mm -hmm. It's going to leave all kinds of money for her and all kinds of weapons, and this is what she's going to use to go on her revenge. But in the script, the way I have it written, she's looking for a rock, and she finds the rock. And then on the other side, under the side of the rock is an X. And then from that, from that rock, she's going to walk 10 spaces, and that's where uh, the footlocker will be buried. However, in the script I write, she turns over the rock, finds the X. If the X hadn't have been there, if she couldn't find the rock, she would have taken it as a sign that her revenge was never supposed to happen. And she would have dropped the entire idea. And so they make a big point about yeah, well, he does that, and like, it, I mean, you're never going to get that across in the movie and whatever, but, you know, he does it anyway, and why does he do that? And that's so strange that he would do that. I kind of like it, but that's so weird. It's writing. That's what writers do. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I've never understood the concept of a, um, a screenplay just being a blueprint for the movie. I write. I do write them like novels. This is novels. true with you. Yes, mm -hmm. this is true with you. Yeah. I do write them like novels. I mean, I, they're not. It's not crazy prose, uh, you know, that goes on forever. But there is a commitment to the prose, and um, there is a literary narrator. Yes. Talking to the audience who is reading it. And these scripts are meant to be read. I mean, to such a degree, to almost a crazy degree, in the case of something like Inglorious Bastards or Django and even Kill Bill, to such a degree that basically I've written a movie that really can't be done. Uh, it's not. It's so not a blueprint. It is so a novel, it, with, with, mm -hmm. the, except, with the exception of the dialogue broken down the, the way it is in a screenplay right. format. That I am stuck on set every day adapting my novel into a movie every day. And like big sequences, I know will 
never. I'm never going to film that. Right. I'm the, you know, but I don't know exactly which ones are going to be until I get there, and then we cut them out of the pro- cut them out of the film because when we the movie will be too long, be too much money to shoot that sequence. But in the reading of the script, they were important. Yeah, they were important for their overall piece. Nah, Hateful Eight is a little bit, you know, is a little bit more the plays a thing. All right, but uh, uh, I didn't have to figure it out so much the way I had to figure it out. But a lot of the things you're asking, though, I mean, it's just writing. I'm just committing to writing it. But in the same token, when you're talking about like a novelist, it's like in a novel, you have an idea where you're going. With yeah. the piece. Yes. And I think like when you've written a novel, my, my guess would be that at least for the first half of the novel, you have a really good idea what might end up happening, where your characters might end up going. Mm-hmm. But you can't even begin to really think about what's really going to happen in the second half because you that was before you committed to being the characters. It was more you, you, before you committed to being the page and creating the world. So... I literally, it's the, after, after a certain point, it's the characters that are going through the story and they're telling me what's going on. Even in the case of like, say, The Hateful Eight, without giving too much away, there is a aspect of, um, I'll say this much. I won't normally say it, but I will say it here. There's a case of a poisoned pot of coffee. I didn't know who poisoned the coffee for a long, long time. I didn't want to know. I didn't do the mystery mm-hmm. thing where you solve it all and right. then write backwards. But not only that, even in the case of The Hateful Eight, as opposed to normally, since no one of the other characters can trust anything that the other characters are saying. They are simply, they say who they are and you have to take them as, uh, uh, as that or not. I didn't want to know any more than the other characters did about the characters. So... Uh, you know, when Chris Mannix shows up and says he's the sheriff, is he? Is he mm-hmm. not? Well, I, I don't know yet. I'm not sure. I'm just only – I only know what John Ruth knows about him. Right. I only know what Major Warren knows about him. And all the way down the line, even when it came to going – arriving at Minnie's Haberdashery and there's, four, and there's four other people there, I didn't know who those four other people were per se. I let them reveal themselves to me. By the time we did the movie – I had to know who all those characters really were and where they came from in order for me to talk to the actors about it. But in the first draft, I didn't want to know any more than a viewer or one of the other characters would know. How is the final cut of Django different from what you initially wrote or envisioned? <laughs> it's shorter. <laughs> uh, uh, um, it's not, you know, it, a, best, a, a better way to kind of describe it is um, when I'm writing... I mean, aside from, from uh, uh, yeah, for the most part, yeah, I don't think there is a caveat to this. When I'm writing, it's about the page. It's not about the movie. It's not about cinema or anything. It's about the literature of me putting my pen to paper and, and writing a good page and making it work completely as uh, uh, a, a literature art, uh, uh, document on itself. That's my first artistic contribution. And, um, and if I do my job right, by the end of the script... I should be having the thought, you know, if I were to just publish this now and not make it, I'm done. <laughs> I've done it. I could actually be okay with just saying that that's it. And then th- that can stand and whoever wants to read it will read it and, that's, and I'm done. Now it's mine to F up if I go forward with it. Now, I always go forward with it, but I actually think you sh- I, for where I'm coming from, I want to love that script so much that I, I'm tempted to stop. I'm tempted to call myself a winner right then and there. Before I climb the mountain, <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. So the thing. So the point being of that is, there's stuff that's in the script that I know will never ever make the movie, but it just makes the the the, the book, the the piece of literature better. It's it's a better read. It's a better. It, it it's more emotionally satisfying. And then you can you can just like you do in an adaptation, you peel that a lot of that stuff away. So what is it? So you write true romance. So I write true romance and then tried for a long time to get it going, couldn't get it going. Right. Then I wrote Natural Born Killers. Right. Tried for a long time to get that going, couldn't get it going. Wasn't working in the video store anymore. I had some weird, little odd jobs keeping going. When you going. say try to get it going, you'd mail it to studios? No, I was actually trying to like raise the money independently to shoot it ah. and stuff. I didn't right. think anyone wanted to buy it, and nor, nor did anyone want to buy it. Because I Now, who are you <laughs> trying to raise money from? Did you know the money people? I didn't. Well, that was part of the problem. I, we didn't know anybody, but we were... <laughs> 
trying. And I would think, <laughs> I think it takes a lot of imagination to look at your scripts mm -hmm. and say, hey, this would be a hit film because they're they're out mm -hmm. there, right? Well, wait, what ended up happening was, you know, I mean, True Romance could definitely show that I could write for sure. Mm -hmm. However, though, but you know, movies have changed. Mm -hmm. True Romance at the time when it came out, when, I'm not, not even the movie, but when the script, mm -hmm. everyone read it and thought, like, this is the wrong way to do it. He's taught, the, the dialogue scenes go on too long. There's too many cuss words. There's this, there's that. It seemed like I didn't know what I was doing because writing wasn't done that way in scripts. Right. You know, maybe David Mamet at the most, but that's it. Is it. So in other words, you broke the format in how you write a I couldn't. Play. I couldn't get past the readers at studios. Right. The minute People actually in the studios who read boring scripts all the time actually read my shit. They were like, this shit is awesome. Send it right to us. But the readers would never let it get there. Because readers at studios are afraid to pass it on because mm -hmm. they look foolish if they, exactly. if, they, if they pass on a real yeah, they were, they, script. They're actually like the... the the most strident group of out there as far as like everything has to be properly done right because they really they're probably clueless they're, yeah. that's maybe why they're readers you mm -hmm. know and, and, and studios have to do that they get so many scripts yeah. they only go with maybe at big studios go with maybe 13 movies a year if they're really happening mm -hmm. and the readers are the ones who kind of look through everything yes it's, yeah. it's, it's they're, they're all the, all the yeah it's like yeah they deadly catch you know they, they get all this shit from the from the net right <laughs> and they have to read everything because they yeah. don't want to miss out on the next big film right yet they miss out on the next big film all the time And I've always just thought, I mean, what really got it, got everything kind of truly going for me, you could point out a lot of different things, but the bottom line is the fact that I realized that the, even the group of people I hung around with, um, they were all great, great, great fellas and great gals. But, you know, it was easy for me to think that I was doing a lot because I was doing more to try to move myself forward than they were. But, you know, that's not, yeah, I'm, yeah okay, I'm a big fish in a puddle. So what? All right, they're not doing anything. All right, uh, so yeah, I'm doing more than them. But um, I realized that actually I need to get my ass out to Hollywood and meet other people who are you know like in my category or or working a little higher, and and I should be the weakest link in my chain that I have, and that'll make me be stronger. It'll make me run faster. I mean, like an analogy I've always used is. All right, if you run uh, the 100 yard dash with a, a people that can't run as fast as you, yeah, you'll win, hands down, you know that. But if you run with people much faster than you, all right, yeah, you might come in last every single time, but your time will be better because they're making you run all the faster. They're making, they're making you dig down just a little bit more. It doesn't matter that you won. Your time is faster. And that's what I knew I had to do. I had to get out of Loserville and throw myself into a place where, like, this is what the fuckers do for a living. And the Oscar goes to Mr. Tarantino. <laughs> This is the second Academy Award and fifth nomination for Quentin Tarantino. He took home his first Oscar in this category for Pulp Fiction. That's cool, Shelley's is my neighbor. Now, very nice to get this from you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, <laughs> Boy, oh boy, you know, uh, I've been saying uh, things like uh, I want to you know, thank the actors for what they've done uh, when it comes to my script, but, and uh, it's, it's not just an easy thing to say. It really is why I'm standing here. I actually think if people are like knowing about my movies 30 or 50 years from now, it's going to be because of the characters that I created. And I really only got one chance to get it right. I have to cast the right people to make those characters come alive and hopefully live for a long time. And boy, this time, did I do it. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Leo ain't over there, but I'm thanking him, too. Okay, I know, I'm getting off, I'm getting off. But one last thing. Uh, I would like to say that it's such an honor to get it this year because I have to say, in both the original and the adapted categories, the writing is just fantastic. This will be the writer's year, man. Thank you very much. I love this. Co I love the competition. You guys are all wonderful. Peace out. Most of these people that talk about writing for screenplays 
If they were teaching acting, they would be thrown out and ridiculed. Because at the end of the day, it does seem like, and I'm, you know, and I'm lumping a whole lot of people, some who may have interesting insights into one big giant group, and that's probably unfair. Um, but again, coming from like a teaching acting aspect, which is how I learned to write, they all seem to me a very actor bad word. They all seem to be result oriented. And real actors aren't result oriented. But real writers aren't result oriented. I mean, the actor wants everything they do to be magnificent, and the writer wants everything they do to be magnificent. But novelists aren't result oriented. It's the doing of it, it's the process, it's the getting there, it's, it's the journey. It's, 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 the journey is everything. The journey makes the destination worthwhile. You can only have a worthwhile destination after you've had a worthwhile journey. And novelists trust that. Actors trust that. They trust that if they live the part and they are honest, and they don't try to predetermine too much that the ultimate, the ultimate end result will be rewarding. And, um, and it seems like people who teach screenwriting go in the opposite direction. Now that is, I am tar and feathering with a big bunch of feathers and a big gigantic trough of a brush of tar. And maybe some people that I'm hitting with that don't deserve that. But at the end of the day, that seems to be what I hear. And it's also understandable because they have to get their results within 120 or 130 pages. And, you know, maybe... If you're judging it by a coloring book and you're getting A's for keeping your colors inside of the lines, then maybe they are right. But I, that's not how I want to judge it, you know? And it can be messy and thing, you know, and, and, and I, I can write a bunch of stuff and then I have to reduce it down to a certain amount in order to make a movie. But that whole process of doing all that is what makes the movie, if you do it right. Yeah, you, you could go on the kind of process that I go on and, and write a bunch of stuff and shoot a bunch of stuff and then you have to drop a bunch of stuff and then what ends up coming out is a facsimile of what it is you intended. Well, that would be a fucking drag and you would have failed, all right? I don't think I've failed. I, you know, I, I, I've succeeded. I've succeeded in a weird way than I could have ever imagined during the writing process, but I've succeeded. And also, where I'm coming from, actually, is those scenes happen. We are informed by those scenes. Yet, it's different, though. There is an interesting thing. There, you know, editing is its own form of writing that needs to be taken into account. Because the thing is, If I included every scene, every single scene, uh, forget about, this. say we were India, say we were Russia, and there's no time limit for what's playing at the multiplex. <laughs> that makes your movie better the longer it is, all right? Um, if that were the case, you would see a different story than the one that you see now, because things would have happened that didn't happen in the version that I, I, I released. And once those things happen, they've happened, and they have affect everything. They affect the characters. They affect everyone's knowledge about what's going on. Now, I leave that out. Now, I meant to leave that out. Now, you're not supposed to know what those different things are, because that's not the story I'm telling now. I am telling now this story. But that is kind of interesting. You know, it is interesting by what you reveal and what you, what, what, and what you don't reveal. The actors said it. 
they worked from it. They were informed by everything because that all happened. But now I, I lose a couple of scenes. The actors were informed by it, but you're not informed by it. Now you only have the knowledge that you're given. Well, that's storytelling. That's part of my job.